Hey, what's up guys? Today is video three in a series of goniometry videos we'll be releasing. If you haven't seen the other two, uh, you can check those out on our Instagram page as well as our YouTube channel. So today's gonna be kind of short and sweet. We're gonna be jumping into finger goniometry, so let's get started. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through a few measurements. Um, specifically, we're just going to look at the index finger today. Of course, all of this will apply to digits two through five. In the finger, you've got three joints. Uh, we're going to start with the MP or the MCP first. Um, so if I was taking an active measurement of that joint, I'm going to ask the patient um, if he could or if they could come down and touch uh, as go as far as they can. Okay, if they had some tightness, then I may not have them pull the PIPs in as well, and I just have them do just strictly just MP flexion. Um, you're going to lay the goniometer right on the back or the dorsum of the second metacarpal. You're going to um, lay the movable end of the goniometer right across the proximal phalanx. Um, obviously, he's got normal motion. That's right at 90 degrees there. Uh, if he did not have a normal motion and there were no restrictions or precautions and we could measure passively, I'm going to stabilize here on the stable end and just take his finger and the goniometer at the same time to get my passive measurement. So short and simple there. When you go up to the PIP joint, I like holding the uh, MP joint in a little bit of extension um, and then I'll just kind of support right here at the proximal phalanx making sure I am clear of the uh, PIP crease because if I'm here and I ask them to bend or flex the finger they're going to run into my finger and it's not going to be a true measurement so clear that PIP crease same thing we're going to have our stable end right on the proximal phalanx this time your movable end is going to be on the middle phalanx I'll ask the patient to bend as far as they comfortably can. We'll get a measurement. He's got, again, normal motion. We're right around 105. Anywhere between 105 and 110 is typical there. If he didn't, I'm going to take, if he didn't have normal motion, I'm going to um, apply the same principles when we are measuring passive MP joint flexion and just push the finger and the goniometer simultaneously to get my measurement. So one thing you want to make sure that doesn't happen uh, when you're doing this is the bowing of the goniometer right here at the axis because um, that will skew your measurement. Um, for DIP flexion you can take this a few different ways. You can take an isolated DIP flexion measurement by um, immobilizing the PIP joint and having them bend. Good. By doing that, go ahead and bend one more time for me. You can get an isolated DIP joint uh, flexion measurement. Typically, or, or sometimes, you can also just have them make the best hook fist that they can and measure the DIP joint that way. So he's got about 75 degrees there, 77 or so. Um, for passive, again, you're just going to take that as far as you can comfortably. So now that we've covered all of the flexion measurements of the finger, we're going to talk about extension now. Um, for, for extension, you're typically, I would say probably 90% of the time, my extension measurement of a digit is probably going to be from the PIP joint. Um, that's just the one you see most likely to have a contracture. But there are times that you're going to need to measure the MCP and the DIP joint extension as well. So for the MP joint, um, you can use one of these finger goniometers as long as it's neutral or less. If you start getting into hyperextension, then we'll grab another goniometer and show you how we would measure that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and lay this up on um, the top of his hand, the dorsal, dorsal side of his hand. Again, the stable arm is going to be in line with the second metacarpal. The movable end is going to be laying right across his finger. A lot of times I just let you know, the movable end balance on their finger, as long as that's not going to come off. I just let their finger move the goniometer up, assuming there's no um, big weakness issue 
um, that you're seeing. Go ahead and straighten your finger for me. And just for the sake of this example, he's not going to go all the way to zero. So, you know, we're sitting at about minus 25 right there. For a passive measurement, you're just going to kind of take their finger and and move it passively until you feel, you know, a firm block or until the patient is no longer able to tolerate the pressure. All right, so now if your patient's MP joint extends past neutral, then you're going to want to take some type of goniometer like this right here that will measure, that will get you a hyperextension measurement. So um, go ahead and extend for me as far as you can comfortably go. Obviously, he's got some hyperextension here. We're going to make sure that that goniometer is, and a shorter one of these actually works a little better here, and a lot of times we just kind of cut the ends off so that we have a shorter um, goniometer and doesn't get into the forearm area here, which could skew your measurements. So again, make sure that's right on the dorsum of the second metacarpal. Lay that down right on the dorsum of the proximal phalanx. Up the finger, he's got about plus 24 degrees of hyperextension. Anything above 20 degrees is considered, or plus 20 degrees is considered normal. Okay, next we're gonna measure um, PIP extension. So very similar to the MP joint, um, I'm just gonna kinda lay it right on the dorsum of the finger, kind of in line with that proximal phalanx. Sometimes I can come here and kinda support and kinda grab the volar surface of that um, joint as well. And then you're going to ask the patient to straighten their finger as far as they can go. See if you can go ahead and get to zero. And when they do that, they kind of bottom that out. You know you're at a zero measurement. Of course, if he's not uh, able to get to zero, say he's getting to around 25 degrees, to do a passive measurement, you're just going to take that joint as far as you can, as far as they can tolerate or as far as you feel that it's necessary to pull them. So you get your measurement that way. So lastly, we're going to talk about DIP uh, extension and how to measure that. Uh, again, we don't do this a ton, but there are obviously instances where we, where we do need to measure this, uh, mallet finger being, being one specifically. Um, so same as all the others, you're just going to kind of lay the uh, stable end kind of right along the dorsal surface of the finger in line with the middle phalanx. We will have the axis right over the DIP joint, ask the patient to extend best they can. Of course, if he was not able to get all the way to zero, we would then take our passive measurement, very similar, similarly to how we took the PIP extension measurement passively. So earlier in this video, we mentioned a few reasons you would not perform passive range of motion to a digit, a few precautions or restrictions or contraindications. I want to throw a few of those out that's most commonly seen. One of those would be something like an unhealed fracture of a phalanx or a metacarpal that somehow would contraindicate motion. Another would be a percutaneous pin or something of that nature that's running through a joint. And in that case, motion would be contraindicated at that joint. And a third would be a tendon repair. So think a flexor tendon repair or extensor tendon repair where you're in a protocol and that protocol does not allow or call for that specific motion at that point in time in the protocol. So those are the three that you might want to avoid passive range of motion to a digit. Hey guys, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to watch this video. We hope you learned something today and that this was helpful to you in some way. So you know our goal for this channel, The Upper Hand, is to give you guys the upper hand as you seek to better understand conditions of the upper extremity and just all topics related to occupational therapy in general. So please take a second out of your day, make sure you like this video and subscribe to this channel so that you can be sure that you're going to see all of our upcoming videos. Thank you guys so much and we'll see you next time.